uh, lovely to see everybody. Um, it's kind of uh, uh, ironic or strange to be speaking about Gaelic in my hometown, Baltimore, um, but uh, I've always kind of wanted to do it because I realized in my adult years that Baltimore actually was uh, from the Gaelic, in this case Irish Gaelic, and it means um, the town of uh, the big house or possibly the town of the mainland, the mainland town town, which not many people from Baltimore, which we, of course, kindly referred to as Baltimoreans, actually know. I certainly didn't until I was about 26. So, um, yeah, the, the work um, that I've done over the past, I guess, 12 years has been leaning more and more towards NLP. But my background, as Peter's you know, intimated, I wasn't actually or isn't actually in NLP. It's in Gallic ethnology and linguistics, and before that, uh, psychology and Celtic studies. Um, so I feel like I'm still a bit of a dilettante in this area, but I'm hoping to address that quite soon. Uh, I'll be joining the MSc course at the University of Edinburgh part-time in speech and language processing from September. So it just kind of proves, you know, I've just recently been promoted to full professor, but it doesn't mean that you can't stop having um, kind of, uh, you know, a, imposter syndrome, even if you get fairly high up the, the academic uh, food chain. Um, so you guys probably at this point are almost definitely know more about the software engineering side of things than I do. Um, but if you have any questions in that area, I'll certainly try to answer them. If I can't, then I'll probably just turn over to Peter. So the questions that I hope to address today are, well, to begin with, because I, I expect not many of you know very much about this language. What is the sociolinguistic context of Scottish Gaelic? Uh, what is the language technology, why is language technology important for Gaelic and other lesser resource languages? Indeed, every language spoken on the planet today. Um, what are the main data challenges? So as far as I'm aware, you're looking at that, um, some of you, during this workshop, how do you augment the data that's available, particularly for things like uh, code switching and speech recognition? What language technology applications currently exist for the language, and where should we concentrate some of our efforts in the near to midterm? So, just to start with a brief kind of historical and sociolinguistic background, um, Scottish Gaelic, as I'm sure you do know, or you possibly do know, is an Indo European language, so it's distantly related to English and the other Indo European languages. Probably in terms of language families, the Celtic language family is close, most closely related to the Latin family. Um, and I don't know if you can see that very well, but kind of if you, you go down the chain, you've got a big spit in the, a split in the Celtic languages between Brythonic and Goedelic, the Brythonic languages being Welsh, Cornish and Breton. Um, Welsh and Breton still spoken today in fairly large numbers. And then the Goedelic side being Scottish Gaelic, Irish and Manx Gaelic. Gaelic um, Manx having um, disappeared for a time, now it's been kind of revived. Irish Gaelic and Scottish Gaelic being the two that are closest to one another, but I should say that um, Scottish Gaelic and Irish are not mutually intelligible, at least not with a lot of priming. So Irish is much further ahead in the NLP journey than Scottish Gaelic is. In fact, I think in a paper released by uh, a few Google researchers a couple of weeks ago, it showed that you know, if you look at the number of papers published on a particular language, um, re relating that to the per capita kind of number of speakers, actually Irish is at the top of the ranking for all of the world's languages, which is quite interesting. In terms of the basic topology of the language, some of its linguistic features, which of course are very, very important unless you're doing kind of an end-to-end -end system or just throwing raw data at something. If you're doing any kind of annotation, this stuff really matters. Um, phonologically speaking, you've got 52 phonemes, at least in the type of Gaelic that, that I speak. Um, English, to compare, has only got 29. Some of the phonemic contrasts that, that are involved are things like vowel length. So you have a word like bata, which means stick, and bata, which means boat. Um, so you have a phonemic contrast there. Um, palatalization, so things happening at the end of words that kind of change the meaning, particularly in terms of the morphology. And aspiration, so unlike English, where you have you know, the key phone phonemic differences between asp um, voiced and, and non-voiced consonants, and Gaelic is between aspirated and non-aspirated consonants. The morph morphological system is actually quite complicated, um, so unless you've you know, learned a language like Latin, where you have a lot of cases and things like that, when you first approach Gaelic, particularly as an English speaker, it seems um, quite dense. 
if you um, are looking at the different kinds of contrasts of things like you know, case, gender, number, and definiteness, definiteness, and these are exponent in different ways. Um, so you could take a word like cat, which is a, f a masculine noun, and compare it to a word like cast, which is you know, similar in form but is a feminine noun. If you were to say the cat, it's uncat, whereas the foot is achas. And then in the dative case, you'd say edechat for on the cat and edechosh on the foot. So you see at the beginning of the word, the C is changing to a CH, producing a ch sound. At the end of the word, you're getting slenderization or palatization, changing a, changing a s to a sh. It's the same thing you get, you probably know the Irish name Seamus. That's the reason why an SE is a sh in Irish. It's the same thing. It's like slender consonants and broad consonants. In terms of the word order, um, Gaelic is a VSO language, so quite different from English in that respect, although there are other types of word orders that occur in Gaelic. Um, to give you an example, Vdishmi Akuhba, I broke the cup, which is literally broke me the cup. So anyway, some kind of very basic things about the language. In terms of the history, um, it likely came to Scotland via Irish settlers around 400 CE. By 1500 CE, Gaelic was still spoken by 50% of the population. It kind of had its apex, um, its zenith around 1100 AD or CE. We don't, of course, know the numbers, but Gaelic would have been spoken the, the width and the breadth of the mainland part of the country, and place names show the historical spread there. If you look at um, place name elements incorporating achag, which is the word for field, we live near, I mean, just outside of Edinburgh, a place called um, Ochendini, which contains that element. Um, then you can see how far the language spread, particularly in the medieval period. So when you hear people saying today, which often happens, oh, Gaelic was never spoken in this part of the country, unless they're talking about um, basically the far northwest of the country or the far, far uh, sorry, the far northeast or the far southeast, then you can debunk um, what they're saying just looking at place name evidence. So Peter mentioned that not many people speak Gaelic today, and that's correct. It's about, well, the last census, census in 2011, it was about 58,000 58, people who had some spoken ability. Um, some skills, 87,000, so slightly more people saying they could read or write it or whatever. Today, as in 2011, the greatest density of speakers is found in the Outer Hebrides, otherwise known as the Western Isles of Scotland, this archipelago that uh, runs from Lewis in the top down to Bada in the south. And along the, the length of that archipelago, you have quite significant dialectal differences. So if you just step from, well, if you cross a boat from one island to the next, then you'll hear quite different varieties of the language. And of course, if you're talking about the Gaelic that's spoken here versus the Gaelic that, that is spoken or was spoken historically in the mainland, particularly in the east, they're really quite different. Maybe not as different as Scottish Gaelic from Irish, but still dialectal variation is something that you need to consider and something that I'll talk about again today. So again, that's the Outer Hebrides. Now, despite these low sp speaker numbers, Gaelic is still regarded by most of Scotland as an important language and worth investing in. Uh, there are thousands of kids in Gaelic medium education today. My two children went through it. Um, their mum is a native speaker, um, but uh, you know, they learn how to read and write in Gaelic medium education. Um, and you find these Gaelic Medi education units throughout the country. So in Edinburgh, there's one, in Glasgow, there are two or three at this point. Um, this having been said, despite the number of kids kind of learning the language, it doesn't counterbalance the number of older speakers that are being lost. So every year that goes on, we lose more and more of the really fluent older speaking population who can, of course, never be replaced. So the Gaelic dominant speakers, in fact, I mean, most of the, when we think about NLP, most of the data that we have that we can use for training models um, in NLP comes from that speaker population, the older, really fluent speakers. So it's a great question how applicable that is to the types of the, the variants of Gaelic that are being spoken today by younger speakers or people who use as much English as they might use Gaelic. So why is language technology important for Gaelic? Well, I mean, I'm sure I don't need to spend much time on this because this is the focus of a lot of what you're doing over this, these few weeks. But the pandemic, of course, catalyzed a lot of changes that were already afoot in uh, you know, human society. Much of our communication today is either technologically mediated or um, it has the computer as the addressee, and this is only set to continue. So if you're looking at a, a small language like Gaelic, where you know, if anybody's turning to Alexa or Siri, they're speaking in English at the moment, 
this drives a wedge between those speakers and their native language or their semi-native language or whatever. And it's frustrating uh, for the people who want to be able to use Gaelic. Um, it's also, you know, it, it defeats the purpose in a way of teaching kids to speak the language because if they're entering into an English dominant society where they can't even speak to their phones in their native tongue, then of course they're going to see it as not necessarily a very worthwhile uh, thing to keep up. So we're hoping to, to provide language technology and language technology resources to push against that a bit. These are of course um, highly valuable spheres of communication or esteemed spheres of communication. So the more that we can promote you know, NLP, the more we can promote language technology for Gaelic speakers, the more they're going to see it, particularly the, the younger generation, as a worthwhile thing to, to speak. Um, I should say as well on that that there's a lot of interest in this. I, I've never had so many in invitations to speak in Scotland since getting involved in this area. Um, the government is slowly becoming interested in providing serious money to these efforts. Um, but, you know, we'll get letters on, on our blogs from, say, mothers with children in Gaelic medium education who have dyslexia who say, this is wonderful. If my son could speak to the computer, dictate to the computer in Gaelic, it would be a game changer for him because currently he has to do it in English. There's no way for him to do it in Gaelic. So this is important, um, you know, on that level too. And I mean, personally speaking, it's the most, I feel like it's the most worthwhile thing I've ever done in my academic career. Um, and uh, it's just hugely, hugely interesting and, yeah, just it feels very worthwhile. Over the last 10 years or so, which I'll call the freshman year for Gaelic NLP and language technology, we can kind of rate it with a report card when we're looking at the training data situation. I mean, you know, nobody's writing, very few people are writing rule-based systems these days, although they can theoretically work better for certain things, perhaps, particularly where you have less you know, data than end-to-end than, um, you know, -end systems or neural networks. But in any case, just looking at the, the raw data and you know, annotation, we can kind of rate the situation for Gaelic. And I imagine it's similar to some other smaller languages. We're looking at digitization. Um, actually, we could give it a high B, I think, because most of the, the material that we have for the language currently has been digitized. So most of the, um, say, folklore archives, which have the greatest assets when you're looking at the spoken language, the greatest kind of spoken corpus of the language, those have all been basically digitized. Some of the manuscripts haven't. That's kind of ongoing, but most of them have at this point. Um, so I think, yeah, we could give it a B plus or so. In terms of acquiring or repurposing data, I would say it's about a low C right now. And part of that a big part of that is getting agreements with partners sorted out. Um, I spend most of my time on, it, on that at the moment, speaking to you know, groups like the BBC and trying to get over that hump. Like they're, they're really interested in this because they know that say, you know, speech recognition will benefit them hugely. Um, translation will benefit them hugely. But it's getting them to agree to say, give me 5,000 hours of this particular you know, radio interview um, program that ran for 30 years and it would be absolutely perfect for, for doing NLP with. But they're like, yeah, that's great. We definitely want to do that. But we need to get our copyright team to agree to it. So it's just getting through that door. We've got our foot in the door, but the door hasn't completely opened yet. Um, and it's frustrating. Recognizing data. Um, so I'm talking about speech recognition, handwriting recognition mainly. I'd say we give it a mid D. Uh, as I talk about when we look at ASR in a few minutes, um, we're getting a word error rate of about like 25% at the moment. So we can index things, we can do a first pass transcription, but we need to really get much better at that um, before it's useful to human beings. And then finally, annotation, I would say it's nearly a failing grade at a D minus because we've got so little annotated stuff in Scottish Gaelic. Um, through one of my projects, we created our by today's standards, it's quite a small part of speech tag corpus, 100,000 words. Um, and that took years to get together because we annotated it by hand to make sure it was really good. Um, beyond that, we've got a large lexicon, a large online lexicon, which is hugely, huge, hugely useful, and then a small tree bank. But that's about it when it comes to annotated stuff. So there's a lot more work to be done there. Yeah. And you may want to repeat it for the online audience. The digitization, uh, can you say a little bit about what genres they are, what time periods, 
because I'm thinking this might be from the beginning of the radio era or something and so on. So yeah. I'm just trying to figure out whether it's mostly uh, elderly people, maybe or older people, maybe more men, maybe more whatever. So or maybe more new style. So what's the general composition of the digitized data? Um, that's a great question. Um, so Gaelic is one of the oldest written languages in Western Europe. We can go back, at least looking at Old Irish, to about 400 CE, um, maybe slightly before that in terms of Ogham inscriptions and stuff. There's a huge corpus of medieval writing, not in, in vernacular Scottish Gaelic, but it's still related. So anyway, I won't talk about that. But most of the stuff that we have is from the 20th century and from the 21st century, predominantly from the 20th century. Um, and that the two big sources are radio broadcasts, TV broadcasts, and media, and then folklore um, fieldwork. Uh, so we'll have, you know, I would say thousands of hours of recordings that were made that from the 1940s to the 1970s, going around the Gaelic speaking areas of the time, speaking to, in some cases, the last speakers of certain dialects but also doing a lot of work in places where, the, where Gaelic is still spoken. In terms of gender and age, it's definitely, I mean, the demographic is definitely an, older, an elderly demographic. That's because of the fire brigade ethnology that they were doing, trying to rescue, as they saw it, um, folklore materials or rescue dialects. And, but also because Gaelic has always been a little bit of a backwards looking situation. People want to hear the older speakers, the people who are better speaking better at Gaelic speaking than they are. So it, they, they term it kind of retro vernacular. That's the model that people have in their heads. That they want to hear what the grandparents sounded like. That's the, the, um, the slap tanche, that's the yardstick for what they think of as being good Gaelic. It's almost prescriptive, they think that's the great yes. Gaelic. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, does that answer yeah. the question? The, the last thing, uh, in terms of gender, I would say that well, looking at the, the folklore, I'm sorry, the dialectal survey, that, that's the only statistic that I have for this. It was about, I think, 35% female and then 65% male. So there definitely is a gender difference there too. So looking at what language technology currently exists, um, the text-based situation is actually relatively good th these days. And of course, it's sometimes a little bit less complicated because it's more constrained. You know what you're dealing with. So we've got a, a lemmatizer. I'll talk about that in a second. We've done PS, POS tacking, syntactic parsing, MT, handwriting recognition, and orthographic normalization. We're just starting the last one there. Um, we've got a web app uh, that I developed with um, a colleague in Lithuania who got interested in Gaelic. And it's great. I mean, he did, he did really brilliant work on this. Um, and it's based on the 100,000 word corpus of part of speech tag stuff that I mentioned before, as well as this tree bank. Um, it's, and it can do lemmatizing. I transformed the lexicon, the online lexicon, um, to be able to refer back to the lemmas. There's a bit of tweaking in Python, but it works really well now. Um, so this is the kind of output that you can get. So obviously the, the token number, the token, the lemma, the universal part of speech tag, the kind of bespoke Gaelic part of speech tag that's using a tag set of about 245, I think, tags, the head, and then the university dependency relation and um, the enhanced dependency graph, as they call it. Um, we haven't evaluated the tokenizer or the parser, um, but we have evaluated the part of speech tagger. And so, the first project that I did, kind of you know, vaguely in NLP, was a part of speech tagging project. It was around 2014. We used um, a Brill-based tagger, and you can see kind of what the accuracy levels were there. Um, today, for the full tag set, we're getting just over 90%, right, 91, something like that. But the simplified tagger, which is about 45 tags, we're getting more like 95%. And then if we use the universal tag set, which I think is like, is it like 12 tags or something like that? Obviously that would be about more towards like 97%. So it's, it's totally usable for most of the things that you would want to use it for. It could still be better. In terms of machine translation, um, Kevin Scannell, who um, is based at, I'm trying to remember, it's in Ohio, 
Um, he's done tons of work for Irish and also quite a lot for Scottish Gaelic and Manx and, and a lot of other lesser used languages. Um, so he built a really nice trans NT system between Scottish Gaelic and Irish. The reason being he's got a massive um, machine, sorry, learning model for Irish. So he can just kind of, you know, just bang the, the just take the Scottish Gaelic, do a few kind of rule based tweaks to the orthography and then figure out what's going on for Irish. It works really well. Um, you've also, of course, got Google Translate. That has really changed things for Gaelic in some good ways and some bad ways. It used to be the case that if you wanted to kind of do a you know, web scrape for Gaelic, you'd really only get stuff that was by fluent speakers. There might have been learners in some cases, of course, but just by fluent speakers. Today, if you try to do a web scrape for Gaelic, you're going to get tons of machine translation stuff, and some of it's really low quality. Um, I will say that Google Translate's gotten a lot better over the years. I was approached by Borsch and the Gaelic, the funding agency in Scotland for Scottish Gaelic. Um, to, they were asking me to go to Google and see if they would build a system for Gaelic. And uh, surprisingly, they were enthusiastic about this, but they thought that there wouldn't be enough data to actually cobble one together. Um, so I sent them a bit of data that I had. I had sent them a kind of a phrasal lexicon and some other things, and I didn't hear from them. And then lo and behold, there was you know, a press release one day that they had created MT systems for you know, a huge number of languages, Gaelic being one of them. When we first tried it, it was middling, I would say. It's gotten much better over the years. I think it was around 2018. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they moved to a transformer model at that point. And then almost overnight, it got better. And then again, in 2020, 21, just like last year, two years ago, again, it just kind of rectified so many of the problems that it had before. Um, so you can use it really well for like a first pass you know, tr tr translation now. Handwriting recognition, um, we've been make, making quite a lot of progress on that over the years. And I did this with one of Peter's colleagues, Mark Sinclair, who worked for a company called Quart, now works for London Stock Exchange Group um, with a lecturer's um, old uh, colleague, uh, Lucy Evans, who worked on a speech recognition project. Um, in any case, Mark helped us with this, and the end goal was to get to an ASR system, but we wanted some really good speech data, and we turned to a folklore archive at the University of Edinburgh, starting with handwritten transcriptions, because none of it, well, not much of it had been typed out. So we had this massive you know, corpus, uh, like thousands of hours, at least hundreds of hours, of, of really good vernacular Gaelic, but it was all handwritten. So we used Transcribus, um, at that point a freely available um, kind of online portal for doing this kind of stuff using a neural network, network based system. And it worked really well. So we were getting, well, I can show you, word error rates for the primary hand, so the primary transcriber of the folklore archive, um, we're getting word error rates of about just, you know, just under five. So the manual intervention that, that's required for doing, you know, just for polishing it up and getting it gold standard is actually quite low. But we didn't have a lot in any other hands. So we were getting, you know, our best model, the mixed model was getting a word error rate of about 14. That's much better now. I don't actually have the WRs for um, what we've done recently. We just built some new models with over 3,000 pages, about 600,000 words, and they were mixed. So we're getting a, a character error rate of 1.0 which is great, and, a word, um, and so that's for the primary hand, and for the, the other hands, which there's only a handful of, we're getting about 1.81. So that's really useful. Um, so we're, we're definitely on the way with that. Um, because of the historical depth of the language, you've got all kinds of orthographies, and this is another really big challenge when you're trying to put together a language model for Gaelic. You know, it's, it's just, you've got so much um, data diversity, I don't, know what else, what, I don't know what else to call it. Um, so, you know, we want to be able to have useful loss of data through orthographic normalization. There isn't even a really good spell checker for Gaelic. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done on this. We've been working on this over the last year or so, and we have a rule-based system that achieves a WR of about 14. We're trying currently to develop a transformer-based system, but the bottleneck, as always, is data. 
And I'm waiting right now and getting a dump of about 15 million words that are all really nicely kind of edited to the orthographic standards that came in about 1981. And that will really help the transformer-based model. We're hoping that that's going to, you know, the, the word error rate's gonna drop a lot. If we can do this, then suddenly, all this historical data going back to the 19th century, for example, that's still really vernacular, good, you know, Gaelic, well, in some cases, it's maybe a little bit more scholarly, but it doesn't matter. It'll still be useful for a language model. We can suddenly have access to that and use it. So right now, like literally half the written data that exists for Gaelic is inaccessible because it's so messy. Um, so anyway, the, we, we're very hopeful about that. So that's the text-based stuff that we've been working on. I'll turn to the audio-based stuff. I mean, of course, you know, these aren't mutually exclusive categories, but um, in any case, the two big ones, of course, being speech synthesis and speech recognition. As important as that text-based stuff is for Gaelic or any other language, I think these are, this is the most important arena for the community. This is the stuff that's gonna make a difference to the people who speak Gaelic on a day-to-day -day basis. The rest of it is important, but it's a little bit more academic. Um, so, um, if we could, for example, have broadcast quality or something approaching broadcast quality, simultaneous subtitling for Gaelic TV, that would be a complete game changer. Because there are tons of people, I mean, uh, Gaelic Geolingo currently has 1.2 million people, which is you know, a fact, I mean, more than 10 times the number of people that speak it, right? Um, so what really is a challenge, it was a challenge that I faced and any other learner, is getting to the point where you can actually understand the language at speed and in context. So if you had subtitles coming up, that would help enormously. And of course, there are people who are hard of hearing as an elderly population that have it as a native you know, tongue. So again, it would help them. Um, the BBC is really interested in this. So this is where I'm putting all of my eggs at the moment. Um, so text-to-speech, um, Sarah Proc, which is another University of Edinburgh spin-out company developed a text-to-speech system of about five or six years ago with funding from the Scottish government. And it's pretty good. How much time do we have? Um, I won't demo it right now, but just if you want to hear it, go ahead and, and, and demo, you know, just click on the link. Um, I'll say that compared to the systems that I've heard for other languages, it's a bit glitchy. It's just, there, there are a few things about it that just aesthetically don't sound as good as what is state of the art today. So it'd be great if they were to update it. Um, but that's another area, you know, I'll be doing this MSC, MSC over the next two years. If I have time, I'd like to do some work on this as well. Because uh, I think that we can do better than what's there right now. Maybe Sarah Proc themselves will, will do better. I hope they do. Um, the other thing about it is that it's not at all you know, sensitive to dialectal variation. So we, don't, we only have one TTS system, and it does what you would call middle of the minch Gaelic. It's the kind of like, if you think about, you know, receive pronunciation for British English, it's a bit like that. If you were to say, how are you, in North US, where I learned my Gaelic mainly, it's kem rahau. Two islands up, it's te rahau. Massive difference. Um, so even something as simple as that is quite different. So it'd be great to have different TTS systems that are, you know, sensitive to dialectal variation, age, gender. This is just a, it's just a female voice that they have. There's a lot that we could do there. So for the remainder of the talk, I'll talk about um, speech recognition for speech to text. And most of the slides here were originally created by Lucy Evans, who I mentioned before. Um, and um, she was the RA in the project, um, who Electra and um, you know, Peter Bell and my other Edinburgh colleagues probably know. Um, Lucy's, Lucy's impressive work on this project land, landed her a permanent job with Court, who were right afterwards bought by the London Stock Exchange Group. So she, she was exceptional for this project. We were so lucky to have her, and it's great to see that she really landed on her feet after the project, because so many people don't. They just go from project to project. The SR project began in 2020 with a small pot of initial funding and then some slightly more substantial funding after that. Um, I'll talk about initially the requirements for training the system, uh, which will be like taking coal to Newcastle for you guys, I'm sure. Um, and then the challenges that we faced and how we resolved them, and then I'll demo, demo it and then we'll start to kind of wrap up. 
traditionally, an ASR system is, relies on three key components. So, you know, generally speaking, an ele an, a lexicon, an acoustic model, and a language model. And I'm, as I'm sure you know, a lexicon is just a list of words in the target language, <coughs> with each being accompanied by a phonetic pronunciation. And we were so lucky that my colleague Michael Bauer did this for Gaelic over numerous years, basically putting IPA transcriptions for 40,000 words in Gaelic. No small task. The acoustic model um, learns to discriminate between different phonemes in the target language. We use Caldi for that. Um, and um, of course, to train the acoustic model, you need a ton of transcribed audio data, uh, speech data, as well as um, the audio itself, which needs to be time aligned. So that, you know, if you don't have an acoustic model to begin with, you can't do the time alignment. So we need to overcome that challenge. There are also some other things, you know, you, you need to remove the punctuation, do all that normalization. If you have digits, you need to verbalize them. We didn't have a digit verbalizer. We did even, there, there are five different systems of doing numbers after 20 in Gaelic. So another major challenge. And finally, the language model usually needs to be trained on, I mean, if it's going to be any good, on millions of tokens. And even getting, when I started this stuff, even getting a million tokens of Gaelic would have been a challenge at least good quality. Um, so, you know, when you're dealing with a well-resourced language, usually the language will have numerous NLP tools uh, to throw at it for the, doing the data preparation stages. But when you're doing, you know, we're working with a, a language like Gaelic, you'll need to create these tools yourselves. Um, so a lot of your budget will need to be spent to the time and effort to actually do the data preparation stage. And it's something you can forget about. When people say this is a solved problem, whatever that is, it's not a solved problem for a lesser resourced language. Um, so I mentioned uh, the lexicon that we had on Fachlug Bic, literally the small dictionary. It's the biggest dictionary ex that exists for Gaelic. Everything's small in Gaelic. Somebody did a, a massive grammar of the, the language a few years ago and called it the small grammar of Gaelic. It's like 600 pages. Um, the acoustic model, well, we used transcribed speech data from a number of sources, mainly interviews, folk tales, lectures, audiobooks, and Gaelic TV programs. And so we, as I said, we needed to timeline stuff. Um, some of it wasn't verbatim. Fortunately, most of it was, uh, but it needed to be normalized too. For the language model, we used the text, of course, from all those transcriptions, which was hugely valuable. We also used um, a corpus of sorts that Kevin Scannell scraped from the internet back in originally in the early 2000s or mid 2000s. So that was before Google Translate, so it's really useful. And we augmented that with, um, with some other stuff. So the text to speech alignment was the next stage in our data preparation, and that was the most problematic because we we're starting from square one. Of course, with alignment, you, you assign a start and an end time to each token, each word in the transcript. And you do that so the acoustic model can identify the spoken words um, in the audio and map them to the component phonemes via the lexicon and then learn the typical acoustic features of those phonemes accordingly. Um, usually, you carry out this process automatically. Manual alignment would just take too long. Um, so for that, we needed a language-specific acoustic model. We didn't have one. Another requirement is that the model uses the same phone set as the lexicon. So our lexicon is an IPA. We actually used an English acoustic model to bootstrap the process. So we had to take all the phonemes, all the Gaelic phonemes, and map them to corresponding English phonemes. So going from, I can't remember, whatever it was, you know, 54 Gaelic phonemes to about you know, 29 English phonemes. So, um, so we co-opted that English aligner model to see the process. Quart had a good one. They provided it to, to us. And that allowed us to create the initial acoustic model training data. So here we go. Um, so once we had done that, once we had all that data aligned, of course, then we could realign it with a Gaelic specific acoustic model. And that's what we did. It was an iterative process where you know, we have a cycle of realignment, retraining, ingesting new data, 
as it became available and gradually we increased the yield of the data that we had already because we could align it better and also you know we're incorporating newer data and so that dropped um, the WR of the model over time. I'll talk for a minute now about some of the issues that faced us in the beginning of the process, especially the problems of using an English phone set. Um, so here, I mean, I don't expect you to, <laughs> to take that on board right now, but anyway, that's basically the situation that we had. And just to briefly turn to one phoneme, so here, here's K. So English has got, you know, very few phones that kind of re revolve around that, you know, articulation point for, for K. In Gaelic, you've got, you know, all these are, you know, they need to be mapped to K. And you, you think, you know, to do that, you're not going to be able to align this data at all. It's going to be far too problematic. It was successful. We were kind of surprised. Beyond that, um, the only other things that were really, you know, difficult were um, vowel length. Because, of course, English doesn't have vowel length as such. It's not phonemic. So it was a lossy situation. Um, but it actually, as I said, did work quite well. Um, the other thing that we had to do was augment the lexicon. So we had about thir 35,000 word pronunciations, but we had, I think, 150, well, it says it here, 150,000 um, unique kind of pronounced tokens in our corpus. So we need to be able to deal with all of them. Um, and the way that we did that was, um, Actually, sorry, we had 115,000 unique tokens. So we needed to train a grapheme to phoneme model. We used um, G2P. Uh, I can't remember the, uh, what, exactly what it was, but I think it was just G2P. I think it was, it was just called that. I can't remember. But anyway, um, so um, we took, you know, we looked at the corpus that we had, scanned for words that didn't appear in the lexicon, Hushkinen, no, which means waters. It's kind of a slightly rare, rare word, or zebra. And we used the Gaelic G2P model, um, and we you know, outputted the predicted Gaelic pronunciation and then added that into the Gaelic lexicon. Or if we found a word that wasn't in the Gaelic lexicon, we assumed it was English, and then you know, we just went down another path and then incorporated it that way. Um, we got a string error rate of 3.82%, which is pretty good. Um, so that allowed us to comfortably augment the um, you know, the lexicon over time. Code switching and English borrowing are a massive challenge for doing speech recognition for Gaelic. So I'll be really interested to speak to you guys to hear about some of the ways that you've addressed this problem um, in your teams. Looking at the results that we got, um, I only have a few minutes, so I'll just cover this really briefly. Um, are we okay? Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so looking at the training data, we only kind of increased the training data over the project by about you know, 1.2 million words. But because we're um, you know, improving the acoustic model, we actually were able to drop the word error rate um, by about 9.5 over the, you know, I think about the 10 months that we worked on this. Um, so we got to the point where we got a word error rate of 26.3. I should say, though, that as in you know, all kind of all ASR applications, it really depends. Some of the things that we were recognizing were like you know, 95% correct, unexpectedly excellent. I'll show you an example of that. I mean, of course, of course I'm going to show you the best example, right? Um, and then the worst ones were down around 10, uh, sorry, like 10% accuracy, so 90% you know, word error rate. We had really bad acoustic conditions and things like that, or really unclear speakers. There's a lot of you know, variability. But you know, the 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 mid range was around you know seventy five percent accuracy, twenty five percent word error rate. Um, so I'll just play this for you. As Misha Madaniskinos, Agus Lukog me as Nilker, Fashk is three fichet as J, Blionadash. Hamikinjach Gerer will me. Dunan a Berkhog, this merging is a Nimatar Shafrut Hachad in a Mavehe, Agas, a Jol, a Sahomi, a Nimatar Rut, Ach, Hanur and me, gonna be Dunan Tangel, Homa, Seva, Vehe, and a Nimatar Imatar Doi. So 
So that's Mahdi Nikhanouj, uh, a speaker from South US, very, very good Gaelic speaker, who's used to speaking very clearly. She was a school teacher, she was a head headmistress, um, and she's used to doing interviews with you know Gaelic media, etc. I'm sure she spends half of her time speaking to the radio. So, of course, we're going to be getting like 95% correct here. But even that, I mean, to see that, when we, when we got this back, it was a eureka moment. I mean, for the language, for us, for the team, it's like we can achieve this, you know? We've just got to deal with some of these other problems, but, but already we're, we're getting to the point where it's useful, it's usable, and we only spent 10 months on this in really high, high constrained circumstances. So um, it, was, it was a really wonderful feeling to, to see this come back like that. Some of the other outcomes of the project, um, so we, we used the alignment system uh, for a Gaelic media company. Well, it's a, it's a government-based production, not company exactly, but anyway, they, they put out Gaelic TV uh, programs and we used our time alignment system to automatically subtitle about a thousand videos for them just as a pilot and it worked fantastically well. We got a digit verbalizer out of this, we got the G2B model, um, our funders were you know, thrilled about the work um, and we got an innovation award at the Scottish Gaelic Awards in 2021 so it's really, it's been super exciting to work on this stuff um, and uh, yeah, so where do we go from here? Um, I should say there are very few people, I mean currently basically only two people that I can think of that know how to program, know how to code, have an interest in speech technology and are fluent Gaelic speakers, myself and one other guy. There's another guy that's got a degree in informatics that he did many years ago. He's probably not that fluent in the language. Um, so we need a lot more people that have these skills. My coding skills are mediocre at best part of the reason that I'm going to be doing the course the lecture did. Um, but if we had a group of 10 people to work on this stuff, we could go a lot quicker. So far, everything that we've done has been you know, bringing in, combining domain experts with NLP experts, with me kind of coordinating things. So if you put those two skill sets in the same people, it would make a massive difference. So that's one thing. In terms of midterm goals, like in, in the next five years, better, more varied text-to-speech, sensitive to age, dialect, and gender, more accurate and efficient ASR. Getting to the point that we can provide live Gaelic subtitling for the BBC would be wonderful. I know that we can do that, even with the architecture that we've got right now. Enable coaching of Gaelic phonology, for example, in Duolingo, that would be really wonderful. And initiating work on natural language generation and natural language understanding. Um, Having a chatbot, like, you know, when you're dealing with a, a massive archive of thousands of hours and you're trying to find, say, everything that mentions the word, I don't know, witch or, you know, herbal remedy or whatever it might be, it's really cumbersome to, to search for this stuff. If you just had a chatbot, you could say, hey, could you go away? You know, if you could run it through something like, um, you know, massive, um, you know, one of the new, you know, massive language models, G, um, GPT-3, isn't it? Um, if you could do something like that for Gaelic, it would be wonderful. Or to have a BBC you know, researcher search their massive archive. If we had chatbots that could do this, it would be a game changer. Also, basic conversation agents. We will get to the, the stage, I think. I don't know when. People have been predicting the demise of the language for like literally 300 years, right? Uh, it's still spoken natively. But we will get to this stage where there'll be very few people in the Gaelic speaking population who have anything like the competence of the people that speak it right now. But all of that knowledge, or at least a percentage of it, exists in you know, the BBC's archive, exists in the School of Scottish Studies archives. If we could put that into a conversation agent that had a pedagogical, you know, pedagogical applications, but also just um, you could generate new content or you could, you know, you could go onto your iPad and say, you know, read a story to my kid or tell my kid a story in Gaelic because I don't speak it. I mean, that would be amazing, right? Um, so I think the work that we're doing right now is important, not just for the next five years, but say for the next 50 years. We're setting the foundation for this language. If it's going to be around as a community-based language in 50 years, this stuff is absolutely crucial. 
So we need more speech data, we need more annotated, annotated data, we need improved NLP pipelines, combining Gallic and NLP skill sets and better um, knowledge exchange partners, uh, partnerships. So there's no lack of things to do. If you're interested to, to get more information about what we've done um, you know, in our teams at the University of Edinburgh, then we document a lot of it at the Gallic Orthographic Research Group blog. The Twitter feeds of, well, my own Kevin Scannells and Mike, Michael Bowers sometimes have stuff about this. Kevin's especially, mine especially. And then we've got the proceedings of the Celtic Language Technology Workshop 1, 2, 3, and 4, which was the fourth one was at LREC several weeks ago. Um, I got a wonderful souvenir for, from LREC because uh, Ahmed and I were talking about uh, caught COVID there for the first time. But apart from that, it was a great workshop and it's great to see all these papers and the diversity of papers that have come out over the last 10 years. Um, a wee thanks to our funders and partners there. Um, and another thanks to Lucy Evans for designing most of the ASR slides and, and being happy for me to use them. So more on thank, um, many thanks to you. And uh, that's all I have to say, thank you. That's a really excellent question, um, Ahmed. So, um, just to repeat it, so are there, are there any people today that only have Gaelic? Do we have any monoglot Gaelic speakers? Um, so, what's the situation in terms of the competency in the language? And um, the other one was how often do people code switch, I think, and where do they code switch? Um, is there a diglossic situation in Gaelic? Um, what are, what's the register vari like, variation like in terms of code switching? So the answer to the first question, um, I don't know if you remember, uh, this was in all the papers uh, a number of years ago, um, Donald Trump's mother uh, was in a hospital in New York and she was speaking a language that nobody could understand. <laughs> she had had a stroke and she lost all her English and was speaking in her native Lewis Gaelic. They eventually worked that out. Today, those are the only speakers that are monoglots for Scottish Gaelic. Very, very old people basically have had strokes who revert to their native tongue. The only other people that might not have much English would be very young children. Uh, and in our case, my daughter, whom we only spoke Gaelic to for, you know, well, I mean, I still only really speak Gaelic to her, and she's 20 now. Um, when she was two, only ever her, having heard Gaelic at the house, when she went into her playgroup, she had more English than any of the other kids there. Her English was more developed than monoglot English speakers, <laughs> which kind of blew our minds. Um, so you just can't avoid it. Everybody speaks Gaelic and English. And um, the situation you have now is that people who are Gaelic speakers, particularly under the age of about 60, would be unbalanced bilinguals uh, veering towards English. Their English would be better than their Gaelic. Not exclusively, but that's a general trend. If you want to find people who are Gaelic dominant bilinguals, you'd have to go to over the age of 80 in most cases to today. Where do people use Gaelic? Where do they use English? People code switch all the time. And you get other things, other phenomena, like calcing as well. Um, you know, occasionally I'll hear something on the radio and go, what on earth did that mean? You know, someone speaking in Gaelic until it translates in, into English. And then it makes sense. Um, where do people use Gaelic vis-a-vis -vis English or in terms of like how much code switching there is? In um, more formal domains, typically people we, were, will veer towards English. Um, also, um, you know, to, to speak exclusively English, I mean. So I gave a talk a few months ago uh, to the BBC and I knew that there would be a somewhat mixed audience there. And I thought, I'm just going to speak in English for this one. 
because if I had spoken in Gaelic, I'd be translating all the terms that I was using. A little bit like giving this talk today. If I was to do this in Gaelic, I'd be having to come up with neologisms for tons of stuff. It's just easier to speak in English. Um, but in kind of middle of the road domains or in domestic situations, people would be speaking Gaelic. Doesn't mean they're not speaking English too. They're just code switching. If they don't know how to say something Gaelic, they'll just naturally use English. And uh, the other thing that I'll mention is that, you know, this is a quite a big problem for learners. I mean, like like me, learning Gaelic is is a little bit like guerrilla warfare. You get to the point where you're pretty fluent, but you can't go to, over that next step because people, as soon as they hear your accent, will switch to English, and they're doing that out of politeness, but also because they sometimes just can't be bothered to speak English to somebody who won't understand them. So you have to pretend that you understand the language um, before you actually get it. It's a little bit like getting credit. You know, you can't get it unless you've got it. Um, so that takes years. And you only get like five minutes here and there, 10 minutes here or there. Um, so that's the situation. People will speak it in their homes almost exclusively, thrown in English. But if they go outside into the post office or something, a lot of times if somebody comes in that they hear that's, you know, clearly not a Gaelic speaker, they'll just speak to, to English, even with other Gaelic speakers. So I hope that helps you understand the, the sociolinguistic situation. Any questions online? Just from the other. Uh, I did have a question or a comment about uh, the, I'll, I'll speak closely here that period and repeat my question to the crowd, uh, about uh, subtitling material. I can narrate from personal experience that I used to have a hard time understanding African-American vernacular English until I realized that I could watch The Wire with the subtitles on. And I'm telling you, it, might, it has really improved. My comprehension has really improved because I could associate the audio with the transcript with the subtitles. And it made a, it, I, I was able to make that leap. Uh, for me, it was more comprehension rather than production. But still, yeah. So that, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, as I said, it's massively important because you do have dialectal variation too. Um, if you have somebody who speaks with a very thick Lewis accent and you're used to a Uist accent, you're not going to understand them very well. So it's the case that, I mean, like Sanjeev mentioned there, even though you might be a completely fluent English speaker, you might not understand dialects that are different from the one that you learned. And to make you feel better, uh, I grew up in Baltimore. I used to live on East Baltimore Street. And when I watched The Wire the first time, I had to to listen very, very carefully to, to understand what everyone was saying. It's not just you. Um, any other questions? Um, yeah, I, I'd just like to ask Will, um, what you've learned from this um, journey that you would apply to other languages in similar positions and like, for, for example, uh, Native American languages or Native Canadian languages. What would you think okay. you would, what, what would you do differently or, or what would you um, tell people working on those languages? So I know where that question is coming from because Peter and I are working with, um, well, we're starting to, to work with um, a, a university or a college in, in Canada um, to get uh, ASR for Ojibwe. And um, what, would, what would I do? I think the most important aspect of this is getting access to the data. If you don't have that, you've got nothing. It's the sine qua non. Um, so what I would establish very early on is to figure out what exists for the language and then approach the gatekeepers for that data. If there is data there, there's, there are going to be gatekeepers. So to establish those relationships very early on to get agreements, to get um, you know, the partnerships established, but most importantly, to get the permissions to use the data and then start working as quickly as you can to get that data in the right format because that will take time. Um, I think with Gaelic, because I came into you know, doing this work as a fluent Gaelic speaker, and I knew the situation in Scotland, I didn't have to do this. But I think if I were to you know, suddenly land in a different linguistic situation, obviously, I would want to spend some time understanding the demographics, um, understand the linguistic diversity of those languages, whether or not you even have an orthography 
you know, these very basic questions are really important. I think when we're, we're coming, you know, we're, you know, we're all used to academia, you're used to knowing a lot. It's to drop your guard a little bit and to be humble <laughs> and to think actually we're dealing with human beings here and it's those human relationships that are so important and to also work out what is important for that language community and it's great to see you know the likes of google make, i think anyway this is my impression um providing a little bit more thought or you know doing a little bit more consideration of the impact of the technologies on the groups and how to approach them and make sure that the technology is working for them and that everything is is fair um, that's ultimately the most important bit of doing this work i think Any last question? Well, in that case, let's thank Joe once again.